So we are concluding our series right before Revelation all summer. Uh, we've been going through the books that appear right before Revelation in our Bibles. It's hard to believe uh, we're basically at the end of summer. Next week uh, is Labor Day weekend, and we all know what that means. That means Christmas is right around the corner. Um, but we've been going through the books, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Uh, these three books are often passed over, especially when compared to the attention Revelation gets. Uh, and yet, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John are written by the Apostle John, the same apostle who wrote the book of Revelation. Uh, he also wrote the Gospel of John. But he was encouraging the church to keep the faith that they had received. Now, uh, to be specific, these books aren't really books. They were letters. They are very pastoral in nature. John cares a lot about the church that he is overseeing. And again, John is well on in years. This is a good um, 50, 60 years uh, that he's writing these letters um, after the resurrection. And so John is most likely at least in his 70s when he's writing these letters, which, you know, in your 70s, that was a lot older then than it is now. Um, and so he knows that he's not going to be around forever. And he wants to make sure the church is on solid ground moving forward as he gets ready to move on. Now, we spent most of the summer going through 1 John. Last week, Pastor Brett spoke on 2 John, and this morning we're going through 3 John. Both 2 and 3 John are very short. They're 13 and 15 verses respectively. Uh, but the scripture for today is 3 John. Go ahead and turn there in your Bibles, as you saw in the bumper video um, 3 John is just a couple of pages before Revelation, the last book in the Bible. You can also look up 3 John on your phones. Uh, both 2nd and 3rd John, they give an insight to how the early church worked. There were these traveling teachers that would go to build up the churches uh, throughout the Roman Empire. Uh, last week was a warning against false teachers. This week is an encouragement to welcome faithful teachers. Um, our scripture reader uh, for this morning is Darby Choker. So Darby, go and make your way up to the podium. As she does, and we ask if you're able, please stand and face the center of the room. Uh, we read from the center of the room to remind us that scripture is to be central in our lives. And we stand because we believe this is the word of God. And so, Darby, whenever you are ready, please read 3 John. 3 John, the elder, to my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth, Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. It gave me great joy when some believers came and testified about your faithfulness to the truth, telling how you continue to walk in it. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Dear friend, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers and sisters, even though they are strangers to you. They have told the church about your love. Please send them on their way in a manner that honors God. It was for the sake of the name that they went out, receiving no help from the pagans. We ought, therefore, to show hospitality to such people so that we may work together for the truth. I wrote to the church, but Diotrophes, who loves to be first, will not welcome us. So when I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. Not satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome other believers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. Dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil has not seen God. Demetrius is well spoken of by everyone, and even by the truth itself. We also speak well of him, and you know that our testimony is true. I have much to write you, but I do not want to do so with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace to you. The friends here send their greetings. Greet the friends there by name. Darby, thank you very much. You may be seated. The power of affirmation is often underestimated. Affirmation isn't just something nice. It is really, it's vital. We all need affirmation. You know, we're familiar with statistics like, you know, it takes 10 positive comments uh, to make up for a negative one. And there have been plenty of studies that show how affirmation improves mental health. Uh, one of my favorite quotes about affirmation is, I can live for a week on one good compliment. Now, affirmation, it's pretty simple. Good job, 
That was well done. I really enjoyed that. You're a great cook. That was a great putt. You handled that situation really well. You're good at what you do. You're an awesome friend. You're a great listener. Your smile is contagious. You have a great sense of humor. I'm proud of you. That shirt looks great on you. I appreciate you. Affirming someone is not that hard. Now, for those of you who maybe have a little bit of a cynical nature, um, we have to be careful of backhanded compliments. You know, statements that sound like compliments, but they really could just be a disguised insult. You know, like, hey, you're not as big of a jerk as you used to be. Or, I don't care what others say, you're all right in my book. Or, you did a way better job than I thought you would do. Uh, my favorite backhanded compliment always came from my father. And he would say things like, and I, I love this, he would say things like, Charlie, I know you're not two-faced. Because if you were, you wouldn't be wearing the one you got on. Now, that's, that's not an affirmation at all. I just always found that really funny. Um, true affirmations... True affirmations are powerful. They encourage us to keep doing what we've been doing. And that's the point of John's third letter. He's affirming his dear friend Gaius. He affirms him for his faithfulness to the truth of the gospel and encouraging him to continue to live out his faith. And the first thing that John affirms is the hope that Gaius brings him. As the letter begins... The elder to my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. It gave me great joy when some believers came and testified about your faithfulness to the truth, telling how you continue to walk in it. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Now, we don't know exactly who Gaius was. And while the name Gaius appears elsewhere in the New Testament, Gaius was one of the most common names in the Roman Empire. So it would be hard to connect him with the other Gaiuses that appear in Scripture. But he is clearly some kind of leader in, the local, in a local church, um, he is also someone John is close to, someone John trusts, someone John cares about. He may even have been a convert of the Apostle John. But John has heard about Gaius' faithfulness to the truth and how he continues to walk in it. And that gives John great joy. In fact, John says nothing gives him greater joy than hearing about those who are walking in the truth. And the reason it gives him great joy is because it gives him great joy hope. You see, in John's day, the world was stacked against the faith. Christians didn't have any legal rights, they were often persecuted, and they were looked down upon by the rest of society. Now, for as much influence as Christianity has lost over the last 40 years in our country, we are still nowhere near the scoff and scorn those early Christians received. Seeing the faith flourish in the lives of people like Gaius brought John great hope, which led to great joy. And that fundamental encouragement of seeing one another walk in the faith and walking in the faith together, that kind of hope that was needed, it would be fundamental in the early church. The Apostle Paul would often write things like what you see in 2 Thessalonians, where he says, we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love all of you have for one another is increasing. This is something I've said before, and you'll hear me say it again. When I see you here at TFRC, living out your faith in Christ, it greatly encourages my faith. When you live out your faith in Christ, it gives me hope. Whether it's things like worshiping on Sundays or going to a Bible study, prayer meeting, being a part of men's ministry or women's ministry, 
serving in children's ministry or youth ministry, serving on a leadership team, serving on the worship or tech team, making coffee, greeting at the door, ushering, working at the information booth or welcome booth, serving at the mustard seed or summer serve or mission Christmas joy or one of the other missions here at TFRC. You know, the fall brochure is out and it lists everything going on here this fall. Many of you will prioritize being a part of the ministry here this fall. And that really encourages my faith. Any kind of sacrifice that I see you make because of your faith in Christ, it brings me hope to see you remain faithful in our changing times is a really big deal. It's more than I can even put into words. Thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. So John affirms the hope that Gaius gives him. And John also affirms the hospitality that Gaius gives others. Going back to verse 5, where it says, Dear friend, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers and sisters, even though they are strangers to you. They have told the church about your love. Please send them on their way in a manner that honors God. It was for the sake of the name that they went out receiving no help from the pagans. We ought therefore to show hospitality to such people so that we may work together for the truth. You see, the early church, it worked differently than today's church. The large majority of today's churches have pastors and teachers who have been thoroughly trained in the faith. That was not the case in the first century church. You would have local leaders, but not all the local leaders were thoroughly equipped to teach and lead in the faith. And so there were these traveling teachers and missionaries who would go out to the local churches throughout the entire Roman Empire and beyond to teach and train the different churches. And those traveling teachers needed someone from the local church to provide food and shelter for them. You know, like today, from time to time, we will have missionaries that we support, and they'll come to visit to give us updates. And it's very common for Ray and Christy Pickett to open up their homes to them. Back then, Gaius was one of those who hosted those teachers. It was a fundamental part of equipping the early believers. In fact, there was this, for lack of a better word, a manual that went around in the early church, and it was designed to instruct the church on how to handle certain man matters. It was called the Didache. And one of the topics the Didache addressed was housing traveling teachers. And so according to the Didache, these traveling teachers were to only stay for one or two days. If they tried to stay longer, you were to send them on their way. But when you sent them on their way, you were to give them enough food for their journey, for wherever they were traveling next. And then you only gave them money if it was for someone else. So if they were collecting an offering for another church that needed financial help, then it was okay to give them money. Otherwise, you were not to give them money. And so the traveling teachers were so fundamental to the early church that there were instructions in how to treat them because it was important that the traveling teachers, that there, there would be some that would try to take advantage of people's hospitality. And the hospitality was so important that these instructions were given so that it wasn't taken advantage of. And Gaius was faithful to those traveling teachers, even if they were strangers to him. John is affirming his hospitality, and John is encouraging him to continue in the practice. Some of you are familiar with this verse in the book of Hebrews that says, Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. This isn't so much a command to show hospitality to anyone, although that could apply, 
but it really is more to show hospitality to brothers and sisters in the faith, even if you don't know them. Because apparently, sometimes angels show up, and they look like brothers and sisters in the faith. So John affirms the hope and hospitality of Gaius, and next he affirms his humility, especially when he contrasts him to someone else. You see, what makes Gaius' faithfulness even more important is the fact that others in the church are doing the opposite. Going to verse 9, where it says, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephus, who loves to be first, will not welcome us. So when I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. Not satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome other believers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. Dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil has not seen God. Demetrius is well spoken of by everyone, and even by the truth itself. We also speak well of him, and you know that our testimony is true. Diotrephus is another leader either in the same church as Gaius or maybe in one close proximity to him. And Diotrephus is doing the opposite of Gaius. He does not welcome the traveling teachers. He does not allow others to welcome them either. In fact, he is putting people out of the church who is welcoming them. Now, these traveling teachers, again, they are key for building up the faith and building up the church. And so he is hurting the mission of the church. And his motivation seems to be a simple one. Diotrephus, it says, loves to be first. So he wants to be in charge. And he isn't going to welcome others coming to teach the church that he's a part of. And it is likely that John has already confronted him about this, and he's defying the Apostle John, which takes a lot of nerve since John is one of the original 12 apostles. It's an issue of pride. He wants to be in charge. Now, when most of us were teenagers, there was a period of time in our teen years when we wanted to be in charge of our lives. We didn't want our parents telling us what to do. In fact, there are things that we would do just because our parents told us not to do them. It's a relatively normal phase of life. Most of us go through it. Most of us grow out of it. And we grow out of it because at some point we realize, hmm, we don't know everything. As a fellow college classmate of mine once said, You know, the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know that much. That's called humility. And here is a truth about leadership that Diotrephus fails. In order to be in authority, you must submit to authority. In order to be in authority, you have to submit to authority. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus heals a centurion's servant. Now, a centurion is a Roman military officer with a hundred men underneath him. Now, this centurion has a servant who is sick. And the centurion comes to Jesus, and Jesus offers to go to his house to heal his servant. And when Jesus offers that, this is the centurion's response. We find it in Matthew 8. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. Now, it's easy to focus on the authority the centurion has. You know, he says to one soldier, go, and he goes, and another one, come, and he comes. But did you notice what he said first? He said, I myself am a man under authority, meaning 
The centurion understands that when he is told to do something, he does it. And he understands that if he doesn't do what he is told to do, he loses his command. He must submit to authority to be in authority. Diotrephus wants to be in charge, and he doesn't want to answer to anyone. And that disqualifies him for leadership in the church. I've been in ministry long enough. I've encountered all kinds of church leaders. And for church leaders that don't have the humility to submit to authority, or don't have an authority to submit to, I stay as far away from those people as possible. They are dangerous. You must submit to authority to be in authority. So John affirms the hope, hospitality, and humility of Gaius. And then he ends. He ends with a human touch. Going to verse 13. I have so much to write you, but I do not want to do so with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace to you. The friends here send their greetings and greet the friends there by name. As I said before, the book of 3 John isn't a book. It's a letter. And many of the books of the New Testament are letters. And they all pretty much have conclusions like this or sections like this. And we tend, when we are studying Scripture, to skip over these parts because it's like, well, this is kind of a waste of my time to really study this and think about this. And, but there is something. There is something to these sections that we need to learn from and we need to remember. See, these New Testament letters... They weren't written in a vacuum. They were written by real people in real situations, and they were written to real people. And these were people who had become friends. They'd become family. They deeply cared about one another. They were fiercely devoted to the faith, and that united them. And their mutual faith encouraged each of them. And when we read these greetings in the New Testament, remember, these are real people who meant the world to each other. It's tempting to try to live out our faith with as minimal contact with other people in the church as possible. Brothers and sisters, the church has never operated that way. From the beginning, they relied upon one another for the faith, and we are called to do the same. We are brothers and sisters. But it wasn't just to each other that they brought joy to. Again, Jesus died for our sins. Jesus rose from the dead. That changes everything. And our faithfulness brings Jesus joy. Gaius wasn't just bringing joy to the Apostle John. He was bringing joy to his Lord and Savior. And that faith that they shared and encouraged one another in 2,000 years ago has been passed down and entrusted to us. So the message that John had to the church then is a message for us today. And we've been going through the letters of John all summer. And John was giving them instructions for their times, and they are great reminders for our time. And here are three reminders that John repeated over and over and over again in his letters that I think it would be a miss for us to walk away from. So I'm just calling these right before Revelation reminders. The first one. Believe what is right. There's a lot of temptation to believe what we want to believe. A lot of pressure for us to conform to what the world believes. 
The church has always been under pressure to compromise the essence of our faith in order to remain relevant to the current fads. John says, be faithful to what has been passed down to you. That's really good advice. Second, do what is right. Right belief leads to right living. If we are under pressure to compromise what we believe, we are under 10 times as much pressure to compromise how we live. Do not grow weary in doing what is right. And then love one another. Never before in my lifetime have we lived in a culture that is so much at each other's throats. Like our culture no longer has the ability to disagree in any healthy way. It's a culture that if you don't agree, you're the enemy. I just finished a summer connections class where we talk about who we are at TFRC, what we believe, and how we operate as a church. And I told this connections class what I tell every connections class. You are going to find something at TFRC which you disagree with. I guarantee it. And that's okay. We don't have to agree with everything to be a part of this place. Now, that's not to say we don't have non-negotiables. We do. But there are a lot of things that we can disagree about and still call each other brothers and sisters. John's instructions to the church. Believe what is right. Do what is right. Love one another. They continue to be great instructions for us. Please pray with me. And Lord, as we do reflect upon our faith and what has been handed down to us, I would ask that you would help us take John's instructions to heart. The one who was a part of your ministry from the beginning. Lord, help us to hear him and, uh, and listen to him when through your word we are told to believe what is right, live what is right, and to love each other. Lord, help us to be faithful to our call. And it's in the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Receive God's blessing. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.